I played Resident Evil 5 when I was 12. You might say that's too young for a kid to play that kind of game. And if there are any parents here, I'd vehemently disagree. I turned out just fine. It was probably a game I shouldn't like as much as I do. There's an intimacy to the media you swallow as a kid. You see a shanty town like this and you can just feel the tension as everyone side eyes you. A guy bringing a machete to a gunfight is really scary somehow. And a villain that can dodge bullets, beat you with his sunglasses, then brainwash your girlfriend is just a part of your memory now. Next to your grandma's last visit and the fetish you don't know about yet. So what happens when they bring that excitement to the game I have emotionally destroyed for myself in the most adult way possible? It's sort of the pyramid head thing where it's cool and all that he's here. But this isn't the Wesker that I know. He doesn't have a virus to spread or Darwinism to further, he's just attacking people because that's what you do in Dead by Daylight. Wesker's a pragmatic dude if you recall, not a programmable bioweapon or really down bad, though I also can't hold it up to that large of a standard considering what Wesker could have been. It's time to die, Chris. This is the power of a god. Uh, you think you're a god, Wesker? This is my unlimited basket. They need their unlimited baskets. I'm sorry, sir. It's one per table. But that's a limit. Dad, it's no big deal. It is a big deal because it's not. Wesker is a killer that excels in catching up and providing a large optional objective through his infection. Generally, I'd say he's probably, maybe, definitely, okay, maybe again, bad. He's a killer that gets his way through a very specific manner, that gets ruined by a lot of little things. There can be situations where you rob everyone of their precious resources, then lock the entire match into one-shot kills. Then there will be others where Wesker trips over a tiny pebble and dies. This chapter came by splitting the Raccoon City Police Department 50-50, and a killer that is also 50-50. One part Resident Evil, and one part the Trickster, for some reason. In terms of visual design, I actually don't like it. There's something angular about his face that makes him seem like he's cosplaying a frat boy rather than cosplaying a statistic. I chalk part of that up to the fact that Resident Evil 5 has dedicated lighting for each shot versus Dead by Daylight, which just has some lamp posts and a garbage can. Wesker is a very odd choice for a killer in this game. There's a big debate on what fits in this game. If that's a debate we truly care about, no, Wesker does not fit. If that's a debate we don't care about, crack open a cold one, buddy, because those other guys are losers. Resident Evil 5 is a weird experience. It's a sequel to one of the most beloved games of all time, but one that took Resident Evil and flipped it on its head until it wasn't what it was anymore. And the story is absolute dog shit. Any moral or theme is basically non-existent. There's no cohesion or progression of events. If there was a lesson for Chris to learn, he sure as shit didn't remember it. And genuinely, the whole thing is a pointless mess, made acceptable by some very strong fight choreography and a psychopath in a trench coat. In Resident Evil 5, the entire game shows you getting mobbed by slower enemies that are particularly vulnerable to being stunned when shot. And where you shot them opened up a window for these melee attacks. A single punch, no matter how big the enemy, would send them flying. Then Wesker is introduced, and in those cutscenes you will find that all the power, all that strength, means nothing in the face of this cold, calculating mastermind. As he slams your characters into walls, dodges bullets, and defeats you with his fucking sunglasses. And the worst part is that it didn't end there. Everything about Wesker in the cutscenes was as real as it was in the gameplay. Your accurate shooting is meant with light speed dodges, as he walks closer and closer to you. Those tanky melee combos that you came to rely on don't even phase the guy. Wesker didn't just look like a badass, he felt like one. So it didn't matter that Wesker's philosophy was surface level. When he said he was going to destroy the planet with complete, complete global, global saturation, saturation, you knew he wasn't messing around. It's like if Vegeta came to your house and gave you COVID. Wesker's power lets him perform two quick dashes after a brief windup. The first is slightly shorter than the second. If you hit a survivor during the dash, you'll carry them with you, slamming them into a wall if you collide into one. If you don't hit a wall, you toss them forward, hoping they still hit a wall. And if there's no wall, you can glare at the guy who brought the cold wind farm offering. It's one of those powers where collision makes a big deal. It's similar to when Blight came out, where a single pixel will stop the fun in its tracks. Unlike Blight, you only get two of these dashes, so both need to count. In fact, this power is a lot more situated to countering W gamers than it is hard loopers. I ran into many situations where my power was instantly stopped by someone walking around a rock. The dash can't be steered, it just goes forwards. Just scraping past a wall means that the fun is over. In fact, I don't think Wesker can go through most doorways. You get a split second between the first dash and the next to orient yourself, but it's only long enough for you to notice that the dash has already ended. On the flip side, that terrible collision also means you'll get generous slams on survivors. Even if you don't slam them into a wall, you will always infect them with Ouroboros. The Ouroboros infection slows you down and gets worse over time. 
The major penalty is that at max infection, you move even slower, and if Wesker hits you with his slam, you are instantly put on his shoulder. To remedy this, there are four first aid sprays on the map that cure the infection, each canister with two uses, giving them eight cures for the Ouroboros infection. You might say that's a lot, I might say you're fucking correct. You might also say that the first aid spray never cured Ouroboros in the game, and I'd say I realized this wasn't being authentic the moment they gave him a knife. Like the way he goes, seven minutes is all I have to spare to play with you, even though that makes no sense unless you have a terminal condition that can only be healed with RE5 references. I hope this speaking thing is the exception rather than the rule. I'll live with a quip here or there, but if every character starts turning to the camera and saying, well that just happened, then I'm gonna start chewing on my PS4. Doubly so after I heard the survivor voice lines, which gave me pleasant memories of Hunt Down the Freeman. The other thing you need to know is that Wesker doesn't grab the survivor while they're in the middle of vaulting something. There is a tiny window for Wesker to swat at them with his tentacle, dealing damage and infecting them. Instead, if Wesker's power hits a window or pallet, he jumps over it, then spends five minutes jiggling his pockets to make sure he didn't drop his keys. In my testing, I found that a lot of chases were actually made worse by hopping over these. It's not without its uses, but you need to be very tactical when you vault. It even stops you from using your second dash, so you can't vault a window then attack out of it. Let's move on to talk about perks. I'd run these along the lines of an average chapter, nothing mind-blowingly meta-changing, and it'll stay that way as long as Sally Smithson is here to patrol the fun. When Nemesis came out, it felt like they were putting their best ideas forward. Lethal Pursuer made a lot of newbies happy alongside Blight and Hillbilly players. Hysteria sounded cool on paper, and then you had to swallow that paper. And every eruption always happened too soon or too late. But they all felt like perks that were always meant to be a part of DBD, if that makes sense. Wesker is a lot more to the point. They feel like they're designed for single situations, rather than broad strokes of chaos throughout the match. The bad one is heightened awareness, which enables you to see the auras of survivors within 20 meters of you while you carry another one. But this perk has to be bad, otherwise it would result in more nurse discourse, and I'd eventually have to see a sequel to this video. Though I do like how this perk is 20 meters of you instead of your heartbeat. I have a feeling this was meant to go hand in hand with the dredge's nightfall, since that removes your heartbeat while drastically reducing the survivor's ability to see you. Actually, I don't think I've ever said this, but I have a theory that behavior specifically makes perks that would do well on the killer from the previous chapter. Like a family father putting his dreams onto his son. For example, all of Sadako's perks are really good at giving you map knowledge and applying pressure in unique ways, which makes them all very effective on a killer like the Artist that is always firing off map-wide ranged attacks, resulting in lengthy matches where you bat at birds all game. And now I'm starting to understand why the King of Thebes floated that little fucker down the river. As for me, the main character, I don't think I'll use this. 20 meters is just too small, and there are better perks for avoiding a sabotaged hook. Superior Anatomy sounds like something Measurehead would say. It's also a perk that triggers when a survivor vaults in your presence. Once the perk is active, the next vault you perform will go 50% faster before deactivating again. I actually think this perk will be kind of valued on killers that don't have an apparent chasing power, like the pig, pinhead, and this nice young warrior that keeps eyeing up your wife. This perk also remains in your inventory until you use it, letting you save it until you actually need the faster vault speed. For Wesker specifically, this is a big deal, as it can reduce both pallets and windows, forcing Wesker's wife to hurry up and get in the car. The final perk is called Terminus. Once the final generator is completed and the doors are ready to be opened, any survivor that is currently injured or becomes injured will be unable to heal. This will persist until the exit gates are opened and 30 seconds have passed. And I think this one is my favorite of the three. It's a bit weak on its own because the gates can be opened in a mere 16 seconds, but you need to think slightly bigger. With this in place, survivors can't 99% the doors till they're confident in their escape, smugly giving the hooked person another round of thumbs ups. And this isn't even counting the extra oomph you get with perks like Remember Me and No Way Out, giving you a solid amount of time to lock survivors into a situation where they can't heal and can't leave either. And yes, this also means that camping during the end game is a lot stronger now. Christ, I'm sure the Legion mains are eating good today if they didn't choke on that Thanatophobia change first. In terms of add-ons, Wesker has a few interesting ones, like the golden egg that he got very politely from the blood web. You will give me an egg! Actually, the egg is one of the better add-ons because the time you have between the first dash and the second is very small. The egg just gives you a full second. However, you still need to remember that you have just a handful of moments before the survivor runs behind a rock and locks you out of your power entirely. You could say that the delay is just adding a few extra seconds of skill issue, but you can move very slightly during that time, allowing you to cross some corners that you wouldn't otherwise. There's also a yellow one I'm a bit perplexed by because it seems rather good for a yellow. 
The bullhorn causes survivors that cure their infection to suffer from obliviousness for 30 seconds. With the green version of this, the bad guys get hemorrhage or blindness, while the purple reveals their aura. Not that those statuses aren't useful, but why is the best one given the lowly yellow status? If I'm being honest, I'm a little disappointed by the higher level add-ons. Like, compare the dark sunglasses to Nemesis's vile add-on. The dark sunglasses give you undetectable when a survivor reaches max infection, a thing that will likely only happen in a chase and when you don't really need it. The vial gives Nembubabasis 20 seconds of undetectable when a zombie gets killed. It could happen when you're hidden, or off looking for a new target, and it comes with an infinite stock of zombies. And just like the Hulk eating Taco Bell, that shit is green. The iridescent Ouroboros vial exposes survivors for 30 seconds when they reach max infection, just in case you're too rich to hit them with the slam that would o-code them anyway. Granted, as long as the pebble economy is the way it is, I think everyone's too rich to do that slam. The bigger thing is that every survivor starts off infected with Ouroboros with no compensation in terms of sprays. That's 4 out of 8 cures insured at the start of the match, which makes them a lot more vulnerable in an economist fashion. Like you made them all buy vandals and armor, but never paid them the next round. The iridescent photo, on the other hand, lets you crash into walls and pallets, causing them to break. This makes him so much like other characters and killers, that you can basically refer to every other guide I made. What do you mean I keep getting to these and then saying, boring, let's not talk about it? Alright, with abilities like these, I tend to use them on pallets as quickly and conveniently as possible. The only time I don't is when there's an actual chance to hit the survivor instead. This might not apply on every character, as some have longer cooldowns than others, but that's why I used the words quick and conveniently. Though I do find this ability to be a bit better than the alternative of jumping over it. Wesker's vault is going to live or die based on the perks he's got with him. Outside of a few loops that include a drop, the stun cooldown you suffer after vaulting eliminates a lot of that value, like doing 100 push-ups then cooling it off with a gallon of gin. That means fire up and bamboozle will do just fine, but I'm going to recommend superior anatomy. This perk triggers when a survivor vaults. Wesker also has a neat quirk of his power. Most characters that have an ability that lets them move a great distance also have a loud sound cue that warns people it's coming, and the virulent bound does not. To make this balanced, Wesker has the largest terror radius in the game by 40 meters. Distressing increases your terror radius by 26%, while also giving you a bonus to blood points. I know that sounds weird to intentionally take a perk that makes it even larger, but as it grows in size, survivors lose a sense of what the terror radius means. It can be louder than normal, causing them to flee despite you being farther away, or if they've been hearing it map-wide, they'll start taking it less seriously. I wouldn't recommend this once you reach the high ranks, unless you explicitly plan on tossing on perks like Callrophobia, Overwhelming and Unnerving Presence, or Starstruck. On the opposite side of that, you can use perks that hide your heartbeat, because your dashes make far less noise, allowing you to get easier infections. Wesker does make a small grunt when he does the dash, but by then it should be too late. There are two go-to options. The first is Hex Plaything. This activates the first time a survivor is hooked turning a dull totem into a hex totem and cursing the survivor with obliviousness until they cleanse it. With this and the Ouroboros infection, any survivor hooked for the first time is going to have a lot of things on their mind before they even think about touching a generator again. Then there's Trails of Torment, which triggers when you kick a generator, then makes you undetectable until it stops regressing or you hit someone. The trade-off here is that you can use this with a larger degree of control. Instead of spreading out obliviousness to certain people, you know that no one can hear you, but it's also taken away much easier. They'll also know that your light gem's empty because the generator you kick is highlighted to them in yellow. The first aid sprays have to be carried like items, and the only perk in the entire game that can knock them out of the enemy's hand is Franklin's Demise. This perk causes survivors to drop items when hit by your basic melee attack, so you can't remove the items via your bounds, but you'll end up using that knife more than you'd expect, even if it doesn't really, really fit. Speaking of doesn't fit, what is the deal with Wesker here? I'm very happy and not gonna join the loser table, but I guess there's a hint of cynicism in me. A note, a drop, a flicker. I'm not gonna say Wesker is going to be terrible bad, just maybe bad. Though that 50% is weighing him down a bit. Behavior smoothed out the collision for his release, and that could help. The power is frustrating situational, and it's going to take a few games of practice, but those few games shouldn't deter you from trying. I've come to the weird realization that in the first few weeks of a killer's release, my words could actually affect how people perceive him. And if I say the killer is useless, everyone will go, yeah, content creator with a hat number 402 said so, don't bother. Wesker's infection can actually stall games a great deal. During tight corridors, a quick use of your power can turn into an instant grab, unlike Blight who has to slam into something first. 
What I'm trying to say is, just because it says I'm a jerk doesn't mean I don't look for reasons to be positive. I replayed Resident Evil 5, and as a sequel to 4, it's a bit less exciting, but I also found that it held up pretty well on its own. No one really gives this game credit. Even if it was probably the snowflake that caused the avalanche, its design limits you in the right ways to make combat feel frantic, while also giving you a lot of moments where the tables turn. It's a well-executed back and forth that makes every haymaker feel exciting and satisfying. Plus, the inventory system is small, so swapping items with your partner is strategic and necessary. Especially as the game throws new and creative enemies at you, wrapped up by finding just as many interesting scenarios that go with its co-op focus. No one paid me to say that, I just felt like saying it. Though maybe DBD will start finding new hip games to pull from, like the Callisto Protocol or that one game that sounds vaguely like a slur. You can't dwell in the 90s forever, and there are no more killers from the past to add as long as you remove all of the ones that I hate. Okay, that's just a joke, I'll take Alien. Perhaps we can see some shocking developments as DBD gets a character from a franchise before it comes out, only for that franchise to eat massive shit at the box office. People will laugh and point at the guy playing them for how goofy they look, the character more famous for being a victim of DVD rather than a victim of Netflix. However, no one brought up the weirdest part. There are two Resident Evil chapters in Dead by Daylight. Everyone just sort of figured that these were all one-night stands. The Nemesis crossover was sort of like an amazing first date, followed up by small red flags like them throwing your PS4 out a window. However, by the second month, they bought you a new one and patched things up. So now it's a year later and they're putting in their sister for a bit. Though I'm just saying, get ready for next year. That's when her dad finally comes home.